when you failed at love or you, it didn't show up the way that you wanted to show up, then you always got to keep top of mind what you want in love. This podcast isn't just some cute little podcast that I created. It's my journey as I discover, uncover, and recover love. And so what I've done in my own life is make love intentional where I write to love. At the end of each podcast episode, I write a letter to my future wife because I want to make sure that I can keep on keeping top of mind what I desire in a woman, what I desire in a wife, who I am going to be when I show up for her. Love is a treasure chest, but once opened, our hearts become vulnerable. I, I went back to Vegas. It was this guy. He appeared as a friend. Sure enough, it led to infidelity. Alignment can't be ignored. We talked about certain topics while I was having kids. She didn't want to have kids. Um, and that was one of the red flags. And I know you desire marriage. So I think it's best you move on with your life. What you do, hold on, Lisa, what you do? I told him, okay. <laughs> she didn't ask me why. <laughs> I knew several other women's bodies better than I knew my own. I've, I watched their videos of them having sex, so I would try to imitate that. No discussion is off limits. Dear Future Wifey Podcast brings healing. You inspire us to try God a little bit more. Uh, but through this platform, I have realized that it's possible. It's possible to love again. The conversations have really helped me to change my perspective on relationships. Season 7 is all about tough topics. I'm Lataris R. Winfield, and welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Cali Worship, how y'all doing this morning? How y'all doing? Man, this is so awesome. All right, let me go back to my script. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Lataris R. Whitfield. Listen, are you still shacking up with us? If you're still shacking up with us, can we get a commitment? Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Make sure you turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about upcoming episodes. Today, we are at Cali Worship Center in San Fernando, California. Listen, we are going to have an amazing time. Give it up for the visionary of this house, Warren Campbell. Pastor Warren Campbell. You know, a certain people that you get around and always, you know, a lot of people always call themselves to ministry. And so I have a tendency to just look at pastors and I'll, you know, I'll look at them. Um, and when I watched Warren, when I came here earlier this month and I just watched him, I said he has a shepherd anointing over him because I watched how he catered to the congregation and, and he was always making himself available. And I said, you know what? I said, being a pastor looks good on you. And that's what I told him. I said, being a pastor is good on you. So give it up for the shepherd of this house, y'all. So amazing. So listen, we have assembled an amazing panelist today. today. Today's episode is called Thankful for Love. How many of y'all are thankful for love? This holiday season makes you reflect on love lost, love that you have, love that you wish that you could get. Um, and that's what we're going to do today. We're going to unpack some of these, uh, this topic and give you a fresh perspective on how to be thankful for love. And so I'm going to start from the back, um, from our guest. Now, I drafted this guest. I drafted her into the ministry uh, of this podcast today. She uh, was going through some things and she'll open up and share it. And I said, and, uh, we were on three-way with Warren and Erica yesterday. And they inspired her to show up today. Um, instead of how, how many y'all know that we isolate when we are going through depressive times, and God wants us to be surrounded by a body of believers so that we can keep uh, each other lifted up. And so I'm gonna allow everybody to go around, introduce yourself, and uh, we'll start from you, Essence. Thank you for the journal entry <laughs> that you just revealed before the house. Hi, everybody. I'm Essence Atkins, and. Um, Thank you. Thank you. And I am here not because I was drafted by Lateris, but because the Holy Spirit prompted me to yield to what was instructed, which was come and be around the fellowship and the love of the house and be with the community and not isolate. Um, so I'm thankful for obedience and that it's better than sacrifice. There it is. Go ahead. MC Light is in the building, y'all. 
Good, good morning. Good morning. Um, I, on the other hand, was drafted last week. <laughs> By a warrant. But exactly, but when, when Pastor Warren says he needs you somewhere, you just show up, and I, I might not know exactly what's planned today, but I'm open and ready for the experience. This is my church home, so I'm happy to be here on a Sunday. Yes, yes, hallelujah. For, uh, and praise to our pastor and the first lady for making uh, Cali worship even possible. And wonderful mm -hmm. to meet you. Yeah, it's nice meeting you, MC Light. You know, I'm... I'm a fan of yours for years, and so it's an honor to share the same stage with you. You're a legend. A legend is in the building. I hear my homie over here, Jarrell. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Praise the Lord, everybody. Huh? You can do better than that. We're in church this morning. I said, give God. Huh? Um, uh, my name is Jarrell Quinn. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a closed book. You know, a lot of people say I'm an open book. <laughs> I'm not, you know, don't ask me nothing specifically about relationships. So this is none other than the hand of God that prompted me to come and talk about love on an open, on a panel. I don't do this. And thinking not strange that this seat is empty. I said, Lord, now it's even over there and it's odd over here. Then the Holy Ghost said, son, that's a prophetic chair. She's on the way, huh? So you see empty, and I see her. She's beautiful, too. Yes, baby, I love you. Hey, man, come a little closer. We're going to do, do like this. Dear future wifey. Hey, Amen. Praise the Lord. Listen, Jarrell ain't lying. I've been trying to get Jarrell on my podcast for about a year and a half. He said, I'm not coming on there talking about no relationships. Oh, but when the pastor called. <laughs> he is here. This, I love this couple right here. This, you know, it's a, there's a lot of times, it's a lot of times we look at certain celebrities and we say couple goals. Uh, but what I love about them is they're real people. I, I just love how they work in tandem with each other. They make each other better. And so uh, y'all introduce yourselves. Praise the Lord, saints. Praise the Lord. On Jarrell stole all the stuff I was going to say. Uh, but I have, oh, well, I was gonna say that. That guy gave me my future wifey in the past. Come on. Huh? When I was formed in the womb, he knew me and he set you apart. Even then, we are so grateful to be in that land of the living. Amen. Amen. God is so good at California Worship Center. To the angel of this house and his lovely wife. To MC Light, Nessence Atkins. To Jarrell. He worked with Charlie Wilson, but he's gonna sit up here and serve God today. Huh? <laughs> They always come back home. They'll go out and sing that R&B. But when God calls them, they'll come right back home. Huh? Prodigal son. It was on Tiny Desk. I seen it on the YouTube. You can't hide it now. I seen you on the YouTube. I love my wife. I love this church. I'm so grateful to uh, have a pastor who understands. I Honestly, I never told you this one. I know this ain't the time, but I'm going to say it anyway because I got the mic. I truly believe you were our pastor for the right time in our life. Other times in our life, God wouldn't have been able to do what he's done with us because of guilt. And when you came into our life, it allowed us to do everything God had and not to be ridden with guilt. And then when we're off the road, we're able to come back here. So God is an amazing and he's an appointed time pastor. And you are a pastor for such a time as this. And I'm grateful for you and your lovely wife. But even more than y'all, I'm grateful for you. Come on. My lovely wife, my rib, we've been married, what, 19 years? It'll be 20 years in six months. So I'll let you speak for yourself, woman of God. Chad, ain't much left us to say. Uh, I'm Melissa Fredericks, Kevin Fredericks' wife, and that's it. Good morning. I'm excited to be here. Melissa, listen, Melissa leaned right when we I got on the stage. She said, I'm going to try not. What you say? I don't want to get in trouble today because I had him on the panel for, uh, at the Stella Wars, and it was hilarious. And so I said, no, I want some good trouble. I want some good trouble. So you just be yourself, Melissa. These people are no strangers to the Cali Worship Center, so, but we're just going to do the formalities and y'all just introduce yourself. I am Erica Campbell, his wife, married for 23 years. 23 years. Together for 26, 20, 22. Just feels like forever. It's so wonderful. I lose track of time. Just looking in your eyes. No, I, um... Married for 22 years, feels like together forever. 26? Yes. 1995, I met you. December. December 9th. Yes. 
Ah, uh, yes, I remember it well. <laughs> um, no, I'm, I'm, you know, y'all know me, Erica, artist, singer, mom, wife, friend, lover of people, lover of Jesus, and uh, glad to be here. Good. This is the first lane. Well, give an honor to God. Move the head of my life. Got you. Got you. On this auspicious occasion. <laughs> Stop Christianese. Man, y'all know me. Okay, I'm Pastor Warren. If you're watching this, you might not know who Pastor Warren is. You might know who Baby Doug is. No, so we, but we Pastor Warren today. Right. <laughs> Depending on what kind of question he asks, Baby Doug might show up. I think we need baby dub today. I think I need. Man, isn't this a dynamic panel? Dynamic panel. And I don't, I just like to give God glory for that, for assembling some powerful people in thought and in influence. Um, the title of this episode is called Thankful for Love. And so when we talk about being thankful for love, let's just jump with you, uh, Essence. Uh, when you hear the title Thankful for Love, how does that resonate with you? I mean, I'm sitting in it, you know? I I'm here because you love me enough to call me this morning and say, come on. <laughs> I'm sitting here because when we were talking yesterday, First Lady Erica was on the phone and she heard what I was going through and she said, you need to come on and be around your people, be around the community, get the joy of the Lord, come and be in the house. I'm sitting here because my sister Light, we worked together many years ago on a show called Half and Half and we have remained good friends and in times of need, we have been each other's safe space. We have prayed for one another right there on the sidewalk with people watching. Like, is that MC Light and S is that gets over there on the corner? And not for, you know, not for auspicious reasons, but we, we, we calling down the name of the Lord. So, you know, I'm, I'm here because love will come back and get you. Love will wait for you. Love will extend grace and love will make you feel safe no matter what state you're in. So that's what I think of when you ask me about love. I'm sitting here because of it. Ooh, that's good. Let's just go next door. MC Light. Thankful for love. Um, what do you think about thankful for love? What are you thankful for? To be here. To have grown. And the love that has helped me get to the space where I am today. And that comes, you know, that's God's love coming through many people. And him first giving me the desire to be better, to be greater, to be called unto him, to do the things that he would have me to do. And because that has been a seed sown in me, I've been able to see those who are coming in the name of him to help. And to me, I, I am most thankful for God's love through others as it makes its way to me. As it makes its way to you, love coming to you. The Fredericks. Um, I think me and Melissa was watching the Rocky documentary last week and it was way more profound than I expected from, you know, from Rocky. But one thing he said that really stuck with me, he said, oh, we just, I just turned 40 and Melissa, we met when we were young. Um, <laughs> but he said, he said, up until 40, life is about addition. And usually after 40, it's about subtraction. You start losing people, you start losing stuff, you know, and he was talking about how you appreciate the things that matter to you because they're not with you forever. And I think when I say I'm thankful for love, uh, not only am I thankful for my wife, I'm thankful for what we've worked for. I think a lot of times people see us and they can't imagine the work that it takes, right? They just see the podcast or the book and stuff like that. But we've been, we be in therapy, we be having conversations, we be having arguments, we be beefing and all that type of stuff. And I think love is more than like trips and gifts and stuff. Love is saying, you are on my nerves, but did you eat today? 
Because even though I'm frustrated, I know you, it's three o'clock, I know you ain't had nothing to eat. Your heartburn gonna start acting up if you don't eat. So here's some wings and I'm gonna get your oil changed. It don't mean I'm smiling It'll at you right now. It'll never be the gas, though. It'll never be the gas. <laughs> you know? Fill up the gas. And I think a lot of times people think love is only smiles and stuff. But you love your children, and that love sometimes look like uh, changing their diapers, wiping snotty noses, going to parent teach, taking them two hours of soccer games. Like, love is more than just smiles and gifts and trips. It's the work. It's doing things you don't want to do when you don't want to do them, when you're tired, when you're frustrated. That is when true love shows up. And I think I'm thankful to have a person to, to be worth putting that work in to and then receiving that same love back from. Ooh, Lord, listen. I don't want to add nothing else. This, all these answers are so good. He said that. You got to go the other way around next time so she gets to go first. Yeah, I got to go first. This was excellent. I think his answer was great. Uh, uh, Essence answer answer was fantastic. The only other thing maybe I would add is um, I'm thankful for time as well. My uh, oldest son is 17. He got a little girlfriend, y'all. He started driving. Like, it's a lot happening in my life. Uh, And I'm I'm really, like, keen right now on understanding, I mean, to the point of subtraction, that one day he's going to leave the house and – this will no longer be his address. And it like freaks me out that thinking like my child is going to grow up and leave. And I mean, obviously he's gonna come back to visit, but like this won't be his physical address anymore. And so I'm really, really thankful that I have time, that I'm still able to be here. We lost um, Kevin's brother last year. And even this Thanksgiving, thinking thinking about that, being able to spend that time with people, making sure that I'm intentional. Um, one of the things that actually after my, my brother-in-law passed, my sister has been really keen on is, um, you know, in the world of social media, they're like, don't take pictures, don't be in the moment. When, when you lose people, the pictures are all you have. Take the pictures, take the video. Document the time. Send texts. They're great, but send voice notes. Um, one of my friends, I don't know why this goes this way, but I'm going to say it anyway. One of my friends, um, her brother actually passed years and years and years ago. We were actually talking about this for Thanksgiving. And she was saying, because it was so long ago before the age of you know real technology, she doesn't remember her brother's voice. And so now I'm like, send the voice note. FaceTime with your family. Do the things because time is a commodity we cannot replenish. You can't get it back. And so I'm just really grateful, I guess, for the revelation and, like, maximizing the time that I have. Ooh, that's so good. So good. Yeah, you got a lot to say. Document those moments. The Campbells. Thankful. Thankful for love. love. Um, Just sitting there thinking about... um, just love. Love is, I describe it as a muscle. And uh, muscles, when used, they get stronger. But when they're not used, they atrophy and become weak. I, I'm thankful that my, my wife um, had the patience with me, uh, allowed me to sort of, our marriage is sort of like love, Jim, because my, my, my love was lazy when we got married. And uh, I didn't know all the work that it, it took, you know. She'll tell you the story how I used to just come home, didn't even talk to her, I just would play video games for hours. What's up, Latera Star Whitfield here. Listen, regretfully, I'm interrupting this recording to let you know that we experienced some technical difficulties. And for the next 20 minutes, the audio will not be accompanied by video. So I see this as an opportunity to bless Cali Worship. Cali Worship Center is a relatively new ministry, and I believe they need an upgrade in their media equipment. And so I already sold a seed of $1,000, and I talked to Warren Campbell, Pastor Warren Campbell, about what is needed, how much is needed to upgrade their equipment. He said it's around $17,000. So listen, I see this as an opportunity for the Lit Fam to join me to bless Cali Worship Center with new media equipment for the Christmas holidays. Wouldn't that be an amazing Christmas gift to give to them? So let's do that. Let's do that and sow a seed. I'm going to leave all the information in the description. You'll be able to donate through Push Pay or Cash App. Um, like I said, just go to the description. You'll see all the information. 
but uh, enjoy the rest of this episode. So after about 20 minutes, the video will come back and it'll be accompanied with the audio this time. Let me know in the comments if you are donating to Cali Worship Center. Thank you. I won't say lazy husband, but lazy in terms of, you know, when you think you have a good thought, like I should do this for my wife. I should, I should buy her flowers today. And five minutes later, you say, never mind. I'll do that later. <laughs> That's who I was, you know. And then so what she did was she allowed me the time. She could have left me several times because I was just a knucklehead. But she, she allowed me to, to get in that gym and she, you know, worked with me. And I'm thankful for that because uh, as I look back now, I was just sitting here thinking about Sylvia. That's, a, that's the street we used to live on. Oh, man, I, you, you could have left me 500 times just as Sylvia. <laughs> <laughs> but you didn't, and you allowed me to, to grow in that muscle, and that, that love muscle to grow. I, I couldn't leave because when I said, God, is this my he that find it? Right. When I asked that question and I believe that God truly told me, I don't think that God would change his mind because he hadn't gotten there yet. So I, you know, I had dated. I had been engaged twice. I was always a long term girlfriend. It was always three, four years. I was, I was just in love with love. So that was always my situation. And my mom told me, hi, mom, she's here. She said, now give him a chance to to get there. He's not there yet. She said, if you believe that this is a nice guy and this is a great guy, give him a chance to get there. You can't expect him to rush just because you're ready. <laughs> Something actually that dad told us. Well, you told me dad told you, and I tell this story to a lot of people, that there is no switch in your back that says, oh, now I know how to be a wife or now I know how to be a husband. And with the great advice that was around us and the fact that I just really like him a lot and, you know, I, I loved us together. And even when it was difficult and challenging, I was, I'm thankful that the friendship was so great that I would like not like my husband, but my friend, I wanted to tell him about the stuff. So sometimes I would say, I don't want to talk to my husband right now. I don't want to talk to my producer. Or I don't want to talk to my producer right now because our relationship is so layered. And so there would be other reasons that held us together. It wasn't just, I know a lot of times, especially in this kind of culture, you're just my husband. My friends are here, my work is here, but we're kind of all mixed and intertwined with, which makes it messy. It's a love gumbo. It's <laughs> messy and, and good and wonderful and difficult all at the same time. But I'm so thankful for our journey and the layers of it. And the only reason we're still here together is because of those layers, the layers of family that helped, uh, that said things, that prayed with us and the conversations we had, we, we grew together. We didn't know how to be married. And I'm just thankful for, like everybody else at the time, the patience and what has become 22 years. 22 years. <laughs> Jarrell, I'm gonna have fun with you. We're gonna act like this is the Terrell show. And the word is thankful or love. And you have five seconds to come up with the song that comes to mind with either thankful or love in it. Y'all start counting. Count down Lord, for five. I'm thankful for my blessings, everything that you gave. Times when danger was around me, my life, Lord, you say. And that's all, we, that's all I remember. <laughs> you stop when you start forgetting. You finish strong. <laughs> strong. So, Jarrell, Jarrell can sing his butt off. Did you know he did thankful and love in that song? He sure did. That's wow. double, boy. There it is. There it is. Look at Look at Look at him. So, when you think about that, Jarrell, you're a single man, right? Yeah. Okay, just trying to make sure you don't get you in trouble. So you're, Maybe. We, we don't know. <laughs> so... As a single man, when you hear thankful for love, what do you automatically go to? You know, when we get in forums like this and stuff and we ask questions, I, I'm super analytical and things have to make sense for me. So when you say things like, what are you thankful for love? That's a broad answer. That's a, that's a broad question, you know. So there's love on different platforms. There's love that we experience in relationships. There's love that we feel for our children. My daughter is 14. And yeah, I know 14 now. Not as tall as me, though. She's not as tall as me. <laughs> but when we think about the different types of love, that's, there's love that we feel for our parents. 
So I have to go to what love is, you know, and the word, that's what I go to. Love is patient. Love is kind. It keeps no records of wrong. It endures all things. And it's interesting hearing everybody speak because there was examples of all of that. Essence, that's kindness, you know, on set. When you were going through something, that's kindness to come and say, let's pray. Patient with Eric and Warren. Was that Dub or was that Pastor speaking or? That, that was some Dub right there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that was love being patient. Love keeping no records of wrong, you know? So when I think of love, I'm grateful for the people who have been patient with me while I grow. I thank God that I'm even patient. When people, when you say you love somebody, that's what you have to say you mean. I'm willing to be patient with you while you evolve, while you grow. I'm ready to keep no records of the wrong you about to do. And are you willing to keep no records of the wrong that I know I'm going to do? I just, I just did it. So when we say we love people, that's what I think about. Are you willing to endure the test of time for me to grow and evolve to be who I'm supposed to be for you and for God? That's good. That's good. You know, we hear all this stuff on these, you know, in these social media streets about, you know, trying to find somebody already ready. You know, and when you talk to couples who have been married 20 plus years, even 10 years, you're you're going through and you're giving grace for the different stages of those relationships. So, Erica, you touched on this and then I want you to uh, I'm going to go to the Fredericks. But you said that. Well, Warren said that through his maturation phase, you allowed him to mature. And he admittedly said you could have left him 500 times. What made you decide to give him grace through the maturation stages? I don't think I was ever unclear on the fact that he loved me. That was always clear. I could always see and feel that. His intentionality when something wasn't right, the attention that he gave me, the heart, the vulnerability that he gave me in those moments was just so beautiful. And even if I was mad and upset, you just can't ignore you know, this is going to sound like very, like I'm talking about a rom-com. You know, like when you're mad, but you're in love, like, is how many kids in the room? Oh, <laughs> hi, nephew. I can't say it. <laughs> you know, you're married, and so the married things that you do, even when you're a little upset, speak to the health of your relationship. Amen, amen. When you can, you know what I mean, be upset about something but still minister to the needs. Amen, amen, amen. Wave your hands present. right now if you can't say. <laughs> minister to the needs. But I think that that thing that we have, so like even, so we do a lot of industry events. There's a lot of things we go to and he'll be in a room and I'll be in a room. I can always spot Warren. I can always find him in a room. And there's something that, I don't know, that's just kind of a thing that we have. And, and I, I think those are the, little inclinations to me that there's, I got him and he got me. Even if, you know, we're not speaking the same language or we're just in a difficult season, you know, because you grow, you evolve, you know what I'm saying? Who we were when we first got married and, you know, that fresh shackles money and no kids and just in the house. And then you grow and we, now we have kids and now we have more things and more layers. And now we have a church and now I have a radio show. And, you know, those, all those things, they change. But there's, when you, when you really have something special, you know, and, and you know that it's love. There's always something there, but I can't get them off my mind. I can't, I want to call you. I'm mad at you, but I still want to talk to you. When I have a good time, you're the first person what I want to tell. When something goes wrong, you're the first person I want to call. So even in the early stages, it was still that. I remember he was upset at me about something. He said, what was, what, 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 what was it? Well, <laughs> relationships have layers and sometimes you make bad choices and, uh, he found out about the bad choice that I had made, and oh, yeah. <laughs> you put the microphone back down. And um, but he kept coming to my house, and he kept calling me. And you know, me and Tina were living together at that time. I was like, I don't know if he's gonna break up with me, but he keep coming over. But you know, he would say he don't want to talk, but then he would come and say, Yeah, I'm about to go to the studio. I'm like, Well, why is he giving me a rundown of his day? He's mad. <laughs> but I think that is the connection. And sometimes he would sit and not say anything. And then he would leave and be like. All right, like, what is happening here? But I think it was 
it was the love. It was that special thing that's there. And, and I, I believe in being honest. I'm not going to say I don't feel a way that I don't feel. Like, I told him I loved you first because I wanted to. And I wasn't afraid of what his answer would be in return. I don't, I don't withhold my, my emotions in that way. If I feel a way, I, I feel a way. And that's how I feel, regardless of how you feel. So even in our younger times, you know, I was just honest that way. And I think that's a part of the thing that's our reason that we're, to, I don't know. Did I answer the question? I think I went a I thousand think you places. I not the question at all. But I said, did I say good stuff, though? It was nice what you said. Did I gain points, though? You got plenty of points. Okay. Plenty of points. For good stuff. What was the question I missed? About the graces that, that y'all have given each other through the, the maturation grace. Oh, yes, yeah, because we like, I did answer. It's because we got something special. It. That's why I'm still here and you still here. Fredericks, 20 years going through the maturation phase, especially when you have, you have a lot of couples, and I've talked to a lot of couples who say that uh, when divorce happens, they say we grew apart. And so it's easy when you meet somebody, y'all got married at what, 19? What were y'all? Uh, I was 21, I don't, I don't remember. Yeah, you don't remember her age, but you just was 21. We're just close in age, yeah, we're close in age. In... <laughs> so, you're 21, that's a lot of evolution, that's a lot of, growth, that's a lot of uh, maturation that takes place on both of y'all's uh, parts. How did y'all weather through the maturation phase and not grow apart, but grow together? Man, Eric was mentioned the word seasons, and I will literally, it's, marriage is almost like a sport, almost, in the sense that every season is new, and there's new challenges, new struggles, successful seasons, losing seasons, Super Bowls, oh, and, you know, like, it's like that. So I think the first couple years of our marriage, was me emulating all the other people in my life who were married. My parents' marriage, my pastor's marriage, I was trying to be my pastor to his wife, to my wife, my dad, to my mom, to Melissa. And it took me, and I'm, you know, not wondering, like, why is this stuff not working? And I remember specifically, we would go to, uh, my, my pastor at the time, he was like, um, you know, you, you give your wife a gift, you get the draws. You give the gift, you give the draws. So I was like, that, that simple. Went to the Safeway, I was like, flowers. Now, now it's my turn now. <laughs> so, yeah, I did, the, I did what he said. I just want, I want, I did, I did what he said. And I remember her being like, I'm not married to him. I'm married to you. There it is. And it was the first time in my life I realized, oh my God, I'm just, and even like being, not being funny, like even like Hollywood and movies and TV shows, we ingest that stuff so much, it frames Absolutely. how we see love. Butterflies, I don't feel butterflies. That's, that's a thing we see in movies and books. That's not necessarily a thing that really happens, but we really internalize that. So the grow apart thing, I believe, this is just my opinion, I believe that you grow apart when you stop actively trying to grow together. So you have to actively- You better say that. Always be trying to grow together. I recently started lifting weights again. For the, a lot of times I stop and start. And what I think is unfair, it doesn't matter how strong you get, you could bench 300 pounds, right? If you stop lifting weights, eventually your body will forget you ever could lift that weight and 100 pounds will feel like 300. You have to be constantly always lifting weights to remain strong. And, the, and marriage is the same way. You have to always be coming closer together, learning each other. Our favorite colors have changed. I used to hate salmon, I like it. She used to be able to eat spicy food, she can't anymore. When I first married her, or dated her, she was very strong, independent. When we got married, she was like, I need to be a submissive wife, that's what the church is telling me. So she like muted herself. And the muted version of her was easier to love because I was just like, oh, I ain't gotta really do nothing. She's just doing everything because I'm the man of the house. Submit, patriarchy, right? <laughs> so in the last four or five years, she shed that part of herself and, and remembered who she was when I first dated her. Remembered? She remembered the first girl. And I was like, man, this level was Reclaiming hard Reclaiming my this time. <laughs> Reclaiming my time. Reclaiming her time. Yeah. And so now this version of her requires vulnerability, which wasn't a requirement in our marriage early on. So it's like, are you willing to do that now? Things and things that you didn't used to have to do, you now have to do. Things you used to get away with, you don't get away with anymore. And I think people just, and I'm not even like shading them, I think people just get tired of doing the work. Like, it's hard. And people don't, we are humans, we don't want the hard way. We want the easiest way. 
And the easiest way has its own results, but it isn't usually long-term marriage. It's not usually the result of the easy way. So uh, I think the 20 years is a result of year after year being committed and coming back to each other every year. Ooh, that was good. Thank you. Lord Jesus, that was good. Essence, you've been married before. You're back in these dating streets. Am I? Yeah, well, sort of, kind of. You're kind of just looking out the window. Can you, and, can you tell what? that to my phone? <laughs> <laughs> you could have had Essence come over here and sit over there. <laughs> Why is she over there? We'll, we'll, we'll fix it in post. Shoot your shot, Doc. You say I'm fixing it in post. Yeah, we move her. Up from the <laughs> wall. I mean, shoot listen, shoot. the AI guardrails will allow it in post. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's this. Do you feel optimism as a Christian woman looking at the landscape in these dating streets? Do you feel optimistic that your person is out there? I absolutely believe he is and I absolutely believe he's worth waiting for but I do struggle with the time you know like watching the time you know seven weeks from my 52nd birthday you know I'm did going hear that? did you say essence about to be 52 <laughs> looking like that so it does it does get difficult when I start looking at the world right but then I have to remember that I don't serve the God of this world, you know? And my eye gates need to be filtered by his word and his promises to me. And as a faithful daughter, as I continue to pursue righteousness and pursue Christ and pursue dying to myself and renewing my mind and transform, like I have to believe in his promises. I don't say that lightly because there are moments you know, again, as you spoke to earlier about isolation, right? That's really where the enemy really goes to town and tries to convince you that, you know, there ain't no good men out there and, da, 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 uh, you know, all that stuff. And, and if you aren't guarding your eye and your ear gates, you will ingest that and then you will start to believe that. So you really do have to be an active, it's again about active participation. You do have to be an active participation in your own faith walk. You do have to make sure that you are guarding the things that you are coming into agreement with. So I come into agreement with he's coming. To Essence's point, I think not only does the enemy add to that, social media also adds to that. Social media will make you think there is no good relationship on earth. That's why I appreciate your podcast, because you show the other side. But it's cheesecake wars, and you get $200 a day. It's just like, bro, who is happy? And I think our need for engagement and clicks, the negative stuff always comes to the top. And we will, somebody said this on social media, and I'm going to take credit for it. She said, um, <laughs> we ingest so much of this stuff, we take on other people's pain as our own. It's not even something we've experienced personally, but we, we attach to that and be like, if he did, he would have did that to me too. That ain't even your story. So we take on too much stuff that isn't ours to carry. And the Bible says, cast your cares on him. Come on, I'm not going to preach today. Go ahead, go I'll ahead. I'll come go back. Go, no, go ahead, go cast ahead. Cast your ahead. cares on him for he cares for you. Now, I, this is the one thing that I really got. One time I was really struggling with that. And I think it's because I was deciding how much I could carry and the weight was never meant for me to carry. So if God gave it to me, it's for me to walk with him, not to carry on my own. So I think a lot of times we carry burdens in, in love and social media, whatever, that are not ours to carry. And we say, okay, God, I can't handle this much. Let me give you what I can't handle when it's really all of his to handle. All right, we'll see the rest at 5 p.m. Can, can I add? <laughs> I, I want to I wanna jump, add as jump well. Jump in. Sometimes we see the bad stuff, and then sometimes it's the good stuff that you're seeing. And every time, with every wedding you see, and every birth you see, and every gender reveal you see, you get sadder and sadder and sadder. And so sometimes you have to know your own limits. Yeah. With let me log off today because this may be the plot and plan of the enemy to literally bring me low because I already was wondering, waiting, and now it feels like everybody's getting everything you know, before me. So you have to be careful in that area as well, you know, and then if you really don't have Jesus in your heart, then you say, bump it, I'll take somebody else's. You know what I'm saying? Because there's those that, that feel that way too. You, got you, know, to went, you know, went there with it, huh? I mean, no, there's a lot of people that are a thousand, for, I, I, I met with a young lady and she's the best heart ever, but she was like, I, I'll take what I can get. 
and 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 she'd been in the situation for a long time, so we talked through it and all that. How many y'all trying to take somebody else's husband? Raise your hand. I, I was playing. Just playing. <laughs> I, listen, I I have a good friend that I grew up with. My good friend, we I've known her since I was thirteen. She called me one day and said she's in a relationship with a married man. And I said, well, you know, that's probably not going to work out, you know. And she said, well, <laughs> I-, I prayed about it. <laughs> prayed I said, about you it. can't pray. Take some money, man. You can't pray for and about stuff that God never intended for you to have. Just it's futile to do that. But some, like to your point, the, the mentality of some people now is really like, you know, if she don't know, then, you know, it's all good. Brokenness, a lack of understanding of love, a, bl- a lack of seeing love or experiencing love. And so when you get to that desperate place, it doesn't mean that, that you don't want it because we were still created for love, right. from love, by love. Yeah. You know what I mean? No wow. matter the situation. So if we were created for that, then even if you don't understand it, you still want it. So you get it in uh, in unorthodox ways or, or, you know, Warren always says that sin is a legitimate need that you meet illegitimately. Oh, that's so, good. It's a, Hold on, it's, say that one more time for the people in the well, back. Well, you say it. It's your, I don't well, want say, to say it. Say it one. You said, sin uh, is a sin. Need. Is literally a, a a need that you. It's a need. It's a legitimate need, but you fulfill that need illegitimately. Ooh, there is a way that under God's heaven, in God's book, to fulfill every need that we have, even in our flesh, legitimately. But we 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 go and we do other things, you know, that are illegitimate you know, to uh, self-medicate and things of that nature and to fill those needs illegitimately. I that's like how that. We, that's oh, how we I, I absolutely love that. How many single people are in the audience? How many, take, pull your hands down, how many married people in the audience? Yeah, look Woo! at that, yeah, yeah, there we go. Give God some praise all over there. Stuck, stuck in the middle. How many undecided people that are married but you want to be single? No, I was playing. <laughs> Let me ask you. How many people are divorced? I'm going to raise my hand. Y'all divorce. Um, it's interesting. Uh, when, we, when you go through divorce, it can teach you. I always say that when I went through my divorce, it taught me a lot about myself. Um, I reverse engineered my marriage, looked at the flaws. That's how I built my podcast was me holding a mirror up to myself and looking at the brokenness of myself and said, this is how I showed up. I mishandled the heart of an amazing black woman, and I never want to do that again. Um, so, MC Light, when you look back over your life, what was the thing that, what did you learn most about yourself after coming through your past marriage? Oh, goodness. Um, there were many things. As a matter of fact, when you started talking just now, I knew the question was coming to me, and my heart started beating really <laughs> quickly. <laughs> And, you know, I'm still learning from that. It's so funny when uh, Pastor Warren called up and said, okay, so we're going to do this podcast. It's Dear dear Future Wifey. And, you know, we're going to have some married couples. And then we're going to have some single. I said, well, I'm not either. (laughs) Right? So um, I've gone through a divorce, but I'm actually in a relationship now. And we're moving. Yeah. Come on. Give some break. And he's here now, but I don't want to embarrass him. But um, what I learned from that past experience is that I was not ready. And even, you know, during the planning of the wedding, because there was so many people so seemingly happy because they thought that we were happy and already to walk down this aisle, that is the one thing I regret is not showing up for myself and saying, you know what? I know that we have told the world this is what is about to happen, but this is not the time. We're not ready. And we needed more coaching. And and perhaps through that coaching and that honesty, that's a, let, let me break it all the way down. Women never be afraid to ask questions. There it is. You know, um, I, and, and you with the closed book, that's me all day. But it really was harmful for what it was that I was trying to build. And coming from New York, when you date a guy, you're supposed to just be chill. Like, no, nah, that don't matter. Nah, I don't need to know that. I'm cool. Like, he's going to enjoy himself with me because I'm not going to pound him with those questions. When the truth is, I need the answers to those questions. 
Teach. And Teach. I think if had I had the confidence within myself to confront, which nothing is wrong with confrontation, you got to get to it to get through it to the other side, I would have asked a whole lot of questions and we wouldn't have got married. That's good. But I wasn't ready to deal with those answers. I was mulling about thinking because I was over 40 that I needed to hurry up and find someone when the truth is it's God's timing. And all you can do is keep getting ready. Keep getting ready and, and be who it is that you want to find. Because you, you can't expect someone to come toothbrush ready and you still got to do some painting and all of the rest of the stuff. So I just say, uh, I am still working on me, but he loves me enough to see me through the process and the patience that it takes daily in, in not only learning who I am, but watching me learn who I am. Can I, can I say something right there? Go ahead. I think that it's important, and, and I, this is even a reason why I'm here. I, I discovered it. Thank you, Lord. Uh, there's so much attention always, like even when you ask who's in a relationship in the room, who's single in the room, there's this taboo feeling of the shame for people to raise their hand at the singlehood. And it's because so much attention is always given to you not dating nobody right now? You not seeing nobody right now? What's wrong with you? When you go to holiday dinners, when you go to Christmas and Thanksgiving, the attention is always on the single people opposed to, so you're in a relationship. Are you happy? Is he or she saved? Are you covering each other? Do you pray for each other? Nobody asks questions to the couples or the married couples because that seems to be goals. So once you've arrived there, it's like, okay, now check off. And that's not the, that, 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 that shouldn't be the paradigm that we live in. So this shame that comes on singlehood, I think this is time to prepare, to study, to listen to couples that has 20 years in the game, 20, 30, 40 years in the game. This is time to prepare. You can't just buy a raw uh, a dish from the store and go home and eat it. It has to prepare. It has to cook. So you have to ask questions to couples. You have to ask questions while dating. And don't take this time. It's not a shameful, it's not a shameful thing. And you have to be, I, I think you got to be mindful to what you, what you say you want. Because what you're seeing in social media is highlight reels. So we only see the successes. We only see the, the kissing vacations. But we don't see the cuss outs in the car. You think you want what they have, but as time shows, sometimes those relationships that you hashtag goals were not, were hashtag I never wanted at all, you know? <laughs> hashtag hell, hashtag the devil, you know? <laughs> Satan incarnate, you know? That's what it is. So you have to be mindful and, and watch what you speak to say, I want that, because you don't know what you're asking for. So, you know. That's good. That's real. And so as I've been learning, I said I'm about to start deep diving into learning how to cook as I prepare for my future wife. I bought some cookware. I bought some really nice cookware and I took it home. And uh, before those that can cook, what you have to do with the skillet first is do what? Season it. You got to season the skillet. And I was like, that don't make sense. I can't just cook, put something in and cook it. And they was like, I read the instructions on how to season. It's a long process to seasoning that skillet in order for your food to taste better and for it to be able to conduct and hold the heat um, to cook properly. And that's what we have to do in relationships. You may get a person and you go, oh, they're cute and they're beautiful and the countenance of, of, of their exterior is wonderful, but I want somebody that's seasoned, somebody that has been through some things, somebody that understands what everything that we talked about, about 1 Corinthians 13, about what love really means. And so, and like uh, Jarrell said, is that when those relationships are tested, that's when you find out that it wasn't sustainable. And so that's what I love leaning wisdom from people like y'all who sit back and say, yeah, and Warren to be transparent and say, yeah, she could have left me 500 times. I was just a knucklehead. And what you were speaking about earlier about these social media streets, you see where it's not a lot of patience. I had someone on my podcast, uh, Raven Hartwell and her husband, and she cheated on her husband. He took her back. She got so much backlash and he got so much backlash because he took his wife back. 
because because in these social media streets is like no once a cheater always a cheater if you you know she's for the streets and she did this but this is a kingdom couple that ran into an obstacle in their relationship and they allowed grace they allowed love they allowed the holy spirit to cover their marriage and they said it's stronger now than it's ever been before um you and i was talking um yesterday yesterday after dinner and said you said you would hate to be in these dating streets right now you start looking at you know whether you should call somebody after you get their phone number today and wait three days in order to call them speak on that erica when you talk to a lot of your single friends uh what do you what kind of advice would you offer to because you said uh with him you told him i love you first uh, uh and you said that you're gonna you authentically showed up with how you felt early on whereas in today's street is like no don't say that first don't do this don't call him it's all this stuff what would you speak on that um it's so layered because depending on how you were raised has a lot uh, a lot to do with how you show up um if you are well loved you know like when a kid is well loved they never walk in the room guessing if you want to see they go hey everybody see this because in their mind i have something and everybody wants to see it but a child who grows up with insecurity comes in the door looking going will they like me will i get screamed at will i get fussed at so will you you carry that with you in your life right so if you dealt with rejection or uh intense um you know like just is it right and did you you know if you if you have that kind of situation that kind of scrutiny as a child it builds this fear in you so that you date like that you make friends like that and you know when you lack in a certain area and somebody make you feel like off all the things from the movie it's easy to i'm not i'm not gonna talk i'm not gonna do everything but i'm gonna keep you within arm's reach and if you make me mad then i'll talk to them like i know now like Oh, she not where chris at okay i'm not gonna tell but she but she's her and her little friends they have they have a lineup First, first position, that's the guy you talk to the most. The second guy, oh, you don't really like him, but when he's not busy, you talk to him. And then there's the third, you don't really like him, but he'll always take you to eat, buy you flowers, and like that. And a, lot, and a lot of people, you can't never get to your heat to find it or somebody that really loves you because you have people that are just occupying space just to kind of keep you busy. And so, you know, I, I, I just, I didn't like how that felt. I, so I was like, yeah, no, I know how I feel about him. Let's not do this. You know what I'm saying? But you can get caught up. Scroll, scrolling and somebody making comments on your page day after day and you go to that page like y'all got y'all got a whole different set of rules that i never had to play by so you really have to ask the holy spirit to lead you you really lead you you really have to check your heart am i am i operating from a place of insecurity brokenness in childhood trying to fix this i need to go to therapy like for real 100 to find out who you are so you can recognize who you're not so so if you know who you are when they come to you trying to say certain things you be like don't, that don't resonate with me. That's not who I am. I don't feel that way. That I don't like that at all. You'll be able to stand up for yourself, speak up for yourself, show up for yourself because you're aware of who you are. That takes time with the Father. That takes prayer. That takes honesty. That takes a good circle of people around you. I'm so grateful for my circle that I can call somebody and be like, that's stupid. Don't do that. You know what I'm saying? You lead those kind of people around you. And I think just in this generation, the way you guys date, it's so challenging, but it's not impossible for God. It's, it's not too hard for God. God is, God is not stop being God. I think God created love, the enemy perverted it, and we just let him have it. You know what I mean? God created these beautiful things, these, these wonderful things, but, but because we see so much brokenness, we see love through the lens of our brokenness, it's hard to find out what's real because we're always in protection mode. I don't want, I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. I don't want to get hurt. So somebody can be there, and if they do one thing, and that may be their human, yeah. their flaw. If they're not a bad person, maybe that's something that they have to work on. If they really like you, it's a really good, great connection, but we cut ourselves off because this thing, thing that was trying to preserve. And I get it. It's not no one wants their heart broken. Right. But when you keep God in the center, I think it's easy for you to kind of move forward and date, date in a healthy way. Good, good. Warren, you, you've been itching, it's, itching to say something. I, I saw you came to Mike. I, I, I just wanted to know his name. <laughs> a million years ago. He asked you <laughs> to drive. I feel off the woods and so he could see you. You should have called me and say, hey, baby, this is at 12 o'clock. And he got, so when he, he got, when he got off that freeway, he could see me. I never went and I came straight to you and told, and told him, don't ever call me again. Is that, is that acceptable, Warren? Almost. <laughs> I need names. <laughs> I need names. Can I address this? Give his Instagram handle. Listen, listen. No, that's great. I'm, I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm glad. 
wife, my wife knows me. Uh, um, I'm not, I'm not the information guy. You know, you know, I don't need to know all this stuff. You know, some guys like, I want to know everything that happened. Everybody, everybody you talk to, oh, I don't want to know nothing. Are you coming home? Are, are you still mine? When my wife was talking earlier, uh, uh, just, just reminded of uh, my father where I get this whole thing from. My dad, <laughs> he said, listen, I got, I got time to play games. Either, either you're mine or you're not. What's this? Hey, my dad said he would sit on the porch in my, in my mom's house, you know, he would come home, come home from, he was uh, stationed away in the, Air, in the Air Force. He would come home on a weekend or something, and he, they were dating, and he would sit on the porch, and guys, guys would come over to see my mom. He'd be like, he'd be like hey, brother, you got to wait. Somebody else is in there right now. Hold on, just. Then they'll, then they'll come out from talking. I said, I said you didn't care? He's like, what? What do I care? She, she, she with me. They just, they all, they all would walk away dejected. Come <laughs> on, mom. Yes. But, but you see where she is. Here you go, here you go macaroni. Listen, uh, Light, I was going to ask you this question. Um, how did you, was it, was it hard for you to open yourself up to receive love again? You, you uh, mentioned uh, uh, your boo things that's sitting in the audience right now. Um, was, was it hard for you after coming through uh, uh, quote unquote failed marriage. And I hate to use that word failed because there's a lot of things that we learn from the marriage uh, that is not a complete failure. Uh, um, but how, how did you open yourself up to love again? Well, it had been some time and I had been working on myself during that time. And it came at, usually when I'm working, there's there's really no way to get through. Even if it's someone who wants to say something, my my mind isn't there. Security is there, you know. So, and um, anyone in this church know Lynn Richardson? Well, okay. So she is the COO of my life, and she's also security. And her wonderful husband, uh, Deacon Dimitri, is here. He is, he is also a part of the security team and not just in guarding my body, but my mind, my spirit, you know, they take care of me. And it just so happens that the good deacon was with me that time. Um, and I was working and as I was coming off of the stage, this gentleman who I thought was attractive uh, and he thought I was attractive and, and simply said to me, can, can we exchange numbers? I'd really like to... Talk, talk with you. Yeah, have a, you know, have a good conversation. Thank you, Jesus Christ. That, that touched somebody's spirit. What, what was that? What was that? Because he was just so direct and let you know his intention straight up. How many y'all are, how many y'all feel that men are lacking intentionality? Oh, look, their hands going up. They're lacking intentionality. So, so by him just straight up saying, can we exchange numbers? I'd like to get to know you. Uh, yeah, I was like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Another without putting those added pressures on, you need to be this for me to feel okay. But you, but you know what? I wanted to just say to the younger uh, single folks, specifically women, you can have your own man. And, and what, yes, and what I'm seeing on social media is learn, learn to be okay with sharing your man because there's not many of them. Or, you know, this, this notion that you, you would allow someone who is, who is spending time with you in a certain way to spend time with others in a certain way makes you somehow amenable or cooperative. That is crap. You can have your own man. He comes from a scarcity mindset. And so that's, that's what breeds uh, that type of ideology. Uh, um, about to wrap up real quick. Um, Essence, what's on, what's on your mind? I'm just gonna give you an open floor. What's on your mind? Oh, grand gratitude. You know, you know, again, this is about love. And as, as I was sitting here, I was just thinking about the hug I got from Mama Campbell who I haven't seen in so long. Um, you know, we all used to go to church together many moons ago before I was married, before I had my son. So it's been some time. And it, it just reminds me that love never fails. 
love never fails. Like that hug was just like I saw her yesterday, you know, and it, it's it's warm and it and it and it is not it isn't self-serving. You know what I mean? And and it's apparent. And, you know, to Lady Erica's um, statement, like that Holy Spirit discernment, it really there's no failing when you are practicing getting still, when you are practicing being in your word, when you are practicing being familiar with his character, not just Elohim, God, the, the creator, but the Jehovah, the personal God, the, the Adonai, the self-revealing God. When you start to learn the characteristics of God, the distillation that you have and being able to see, really see, you don't waste time. I mean, it's not that I don't have dates available, but I know I know who I am and I know what I'm looking for. And I trust God in the process, even though sometimes the process feels absurdly long. <laughs> but, um, you know, and, and it's moments like that hug that remind me, no, 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 this is real. He is real. You know, it's what you were talking about in terms of how, how people show up, right? The, the love that shows up, like, it's not, we get so focused on the eros, on the romantic love, but love is, we were created in love and love is all around us. Love is in the trees. You know, Color Purple's getting ready to come out and I love, I love that Mama Camel's got on purple, but one of my favorite things about that movie, there's a, a piece of dialogue in the original version. I, don't, I haven't seen the, the new one yet, but where it talks about, you know, where she says to Celie, she goes, I Shug says, I think it pisses God off when you walk by the color purple and don't notice it. And then, and then she says, well, what are you saying? God is jealous. And she says, everything wants to be loved. And I, and I believe that that is, a, that that is innate, that that is, that is part of the soil of us, that we want to be loved. But again, it's about not letting the enemy pervert it. And, and waiting for, for what God intends it to be. But it's, but it's available. I, I believe that and I know that just, just as well, well as I know I'm sitting here, it's available. Just as well as I'm looking at these incredible couples, it's available. But yeah, Melissa, speak from your soul. Um, I wanted to say earlier that um, I think that there is a, a myth about this idea of like working on yourself. And I think the reality is, especially when you're single, it's like, you know, work, you need to work on yourself. You need to work on yourself. And I think the reality is I got married at 21, 20. Yes. For y'all that was doing the math. That's correct. That's not a lot of time to work on yourself. The, the reality is I worked, grew and evolved in this relationship. God, God just happened to bless me that I buried the right one. But I have changed and evolved a lot. And, and that is okay. And I think that is what dating is supposed to be. Because you think you show up one way. You think you like a certain thing. And then once you're confronted, you realize you respond a whole other different way. You think you want someone like this. And then you have that personality and you realize... Oh, we are oil and water. This this will never ever work. And so the next you learn that, and then you go into your next relationship with that information to do again. I was I was twenty. I didn't have no whole bunch of the re I dated two people. One. No one. No one existed before. Me. You're correct. <laughs> Think you of your correct. imagination. You're, you're correct. As, as my sister, as, as my Madison, sister, would, as my sister would say, I don't I don't have any exes, but if I did. <laughs> If I did, it was probably two. And, and one of them was a church relationship, which means I only saw him on Sundays because I, I didn't have a license and neither did he. Uh, so that halfway didn't count. Uh, so again, I just think that there is, it is okay. You know, we, we did a, or yeah, well, we're closing it down now, but we did a podcast called Marriage Be Hard. And a lot of times couples would come on and they would tell us, I really don't think marriage is hard. And I think, God bless you. Okay. If that is your testimony, God bless you and may your lineage be blessed. 
Yeah. That was not only my testimony. I am so enjoying this, this season in our relationship because of how much we have grown and we've learned to like appreciate and work together. But but that was a process. Work, working with your um working with your spouse is a challenge unto itself. Because not only are we, you know, there's a dynamic of the coworker aspect, also someone must take a lead. In a, in a project, we can't both be, you know, you could try to be co-captains, but really someone has to be able to make the decision, okay? And when you see things differently, which we often do, you have to work through that. And then you need to lay down at night and look at this person as your spouse and take off the coworker aspect, take off the business partner aspect. And that's not always easy, at least for me, okay? Because I still want to be mad at the person earlier today oh you the same person want to be my husband and touch my leg i need you to back up off because i'm still angry and so but i have to learn through that and again growing up in church you know you believe in our taught never let the sun go down in your anger and then i realized i could know how to hold a grudge a little bit and so then i have to learn how to communicate i'm still working on it because some days i still be like that listen the sun got to go down the sun got to go down. We got to talk about this tomorrow because today I'm not in the right space. And that's okay. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. Um, and so, again, these are all the things that you just learn and you grow. And I think that that is okay. I think that's ultimately what I want to say. If you're going through um, your singleness and you're, you're having a hard time, it's okay. It's okay. In your marriage and you're going through a hard time, it is is okay. You can look at me and Kev on the podcast, on the social medias, and think of us as couple goals and know for every picture you see, there's a thousand on the scrap floor that we trash because my face was looking angry, because my eyes was crossed, because I didn't like the way my thigh was showing, because I didn't like come closer to me. There's a gazillion photos that didn't make the feed. There's a gazillion photo that didn't make the feed. And that's the struggle. The struggle is not the photo that's on the feed. It's that how we filter through all the mess that people don't see, what goes on behind the scenes. When we're in the door, when we're in the car, one of my favorite shows growing up uh, when I was a kid, I just always have had a fascination with like love and relationships. But I used to watch uh, Mad About You. Don't ask me why this like 10 year old black girl is watching this show about these middle-aged white people. <laughs> I don't know why, but I loved it. And um, recently, actually, I was watching, um, he was like the producer, the creator of the show, and he was talking about like the premise of the show. And one of the things he said was the whole point of the show is the moment a couple leaves a party, a get together, whatever, they're all buttoned up, they're all having a good time, and they get in the car, and immediately they pick up the argument that took place from the house, because we all do it. You leave the house, you argue, and you fuss, and you walk to the door, hello, Hi. Yes, and you get back in the car and you're just like this again. And now we need to pick this back up. All of that is so normal and it is so okay. And it's really about how you get through that. And that is, um, again, that is work. And I think that is important. You're not abnormal. You're not going through this alone. If you're having a hard season, all of that is normal because that is what life is. It's about evolution. It's about growth. It's about trials. It's about tribulations and being able to come out on the side and tell somebody, let me tell you about we. Yes. That's it. That's all. That's it. That's it. Jarrell, for the single brothers, what would you like to say? What's on your heart? How much time do we have? <laughs> um, this is this is to you know when when you see me, you you see a a dad you know you see um, someone who has been in relationships and done it wrong, like a lot of people who are single and a lot of people who are married. I would say, this is not just for single brothers, but for people. Know your worth. I'll say that again know your worth because a lot of times when we you know come to events that's always told to ladies that's always told to women baby girl know your worth because these men out here dot 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 fill in the blank they're trash they're this 
and that's true. Some are. But also, to single brothers, there are some who are trying to get it right. There are some who are trying to raise their kids to the best of their abilities. There are some without children who are trying to be the men of God who we're supposed to be for the wife, for you, for your calling. Relationships, I believe, are a step. It's not the end goal. Call it controversy, but marriage is not for everybody. Bible says if you can keep, if you can keep yourself, if you can keep yourself, it's better to serve the Lord and go on about your day. So everybody doesn't have a desire to get married, so that's forced upon you because society does that. But you have to know what your story is. You have to consult with God Almighty to know, is that even something for me first? Because you could be, people could be making you want something that's not even yours. That'll land tomorrow. Know what your story is, know what your process is, and know your worth. And I got to say to the single brother, because I haven't been through what I've been through just to live it by myself, I do have to be more open and I do have to share because everybody with the story doesn't have the microphone. God blesses me with one sometimes. So I'm going to say brothers who are trying to get it work. There are some women who are not about God's business. There are some women who want to steal, take, kill, destroy, and we as single brothers who are trying to be in alignment with the word of God and with God for real, we can joke and we can play, but at the end of the day, I want what God wants for me for real, and I want to be everything that he created me to be, so I can't let anybody, although she may be son, <laughs> not at all. although there's some, there's some sense now that have come out that smell wonderful, and I believe the Holy Spirit is in them, and some of some of Satan's daughters own these sets, and they smell good, but we cannot be, we cannot be distracted. So yes, to, 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 to women, know your worth, but also that is a blanket statement to men as well. Know your worth, and when somebody comes along in a pretty dress, but the Holy Spirit tells you she's not it, she's not the one for you, we got to obey that because destruction comes on the other side of not obeying that. So my takeaway, know your worth. That's good. I want to open it up about 10 minutes to the audience. Uh, a Q&A, if y'all have some quick questions. Uh, Q&As. Where, what microphone can they use? We have, let's use one of these. One of those. Um, here he comes, perfect. Anybody got any questions? Any questions? I got no questions? I always wait for the first person to, to break the ice. You sit right here. Y'all can come down. Are you uh, over there? Yeah, do this. If you have a question, just come to the center aisle. So we can just go ahead and just hit y'all one after another. If you have a question, come over. How you doing? Yes, ma'am. I'm good. Um, I'm 55. I was married 28 years. And something that and I've been divorced. Hold the microphone close to your mouth. I'm 55. I was married 28 years. I've been divorced six years. And something that Melissa's husband, Kevin, Kevin. Kevin Melissa's husband, Kevin, <laughs> said it, uh, resonated with me about the love being uh, a muscle. And I remember, you know, you have a whole lot of assets and things that you are, if you've been married 28 years, when you're divorced, it's a lot too. And I remember my prayer being, Lord, if you just allow me to still be able to love the way I love. I'll be all right. I don't want to come out of this jaded, bitter, or what have you. And he left me with that ability. And so I came out of it like, I'm on fire. I can still love. This is great. I'm not jaded. But if you are being mindful of the company you keep and you don't want to keep unworthy company or what have you, how do you exercise that muscle so that it doesn't atrophy? Because what I'm finding is I'm not bitter at all, but I don't feel like my love muscle is as strong as it was three years ago, five years ago, because I haven't exercised it, I realize. Good. Uh, perfect question for you, MC Light, as he did. Yeah, because the question that... I want to know the answer, too. Well, well listen. <laughs> you said, what was the question that your, 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 your dude asked you? 
And was I open to love? Was you open to love? You instantly said yes. Yeah, but I was being, you know, <laughs> I was, yeah, you know, I was being honorary, like, of course. But I think in it, he was patient enough. And, and I remember also one day he looked at me and he said, I see you. And I knew that he saw me. So for as long as it would take, would be as long as it would take. And in that is the vo lies all of the vulnerability and the love, you know, it allows it to pour out. I thought you didn't know the answer. Well, the, her situation is a little different. <laughs> She said that she's been out the game, what, six years? Yeah, and when I got in the game, much like you, like, I married the only guy I ever dated because, like, my mama was like, and my daddy, you want to see her again, then you're going to have to marry her. You know, you dated her once, that's it, pretty much. So I really did, I married the only guy I had ever kissed. Who does that? See, that ain't my story. No. Nah. <laughs> you just saying. Look. <laughs> I think they can help with the answer to that one. I will say, I'm very excited. I'm married. Mary. I don't know if I can help you, but I'm going to tell you, uh, I do kiss the only man I ever, I mean, I married the man. What up, Trim? I married Mary. the man, the only man I ever kissed is Kevin Fredericks. Same. So I, I feel you. So it's, it's very, it's different. You know, you get divorced and you're like, oh my goodness. You know, I got to, so. But I, I I'll speak on it real shortly. The reality is this, and this is my whole podcast, is to make love intentional. When you, when you failed at love or you, it didn't show up the way that you wanted to show up, then you always got to keep top of mind what you want in love. This podcast isn't just some cute little podcast that I created. It's my journey as I discover, uncover, and recover love. And so the, the discover part is who am I now after coming out of a marriage? Who, the, this dating landscape looks different. I look different. I got married at the age of 28. I'm 45 now. So everything looks different. The, the quote unquote needs that we come to know that women wanted back then, it was real, real simple back then. You know, it was just really, really simple. Almost so simple as do you like me circle yes or no. It was real simple. Now people want this uh, soft life and 100% pay the bills or 50, 50, all this crazy stuff that has been inundating our minds on what to look for in a husband and look for in a wife that it just wasn't around. We got terms that are, you know, uh, femininity and, and words like that and masculinity. I want a feminine wife. I want a submissive wife. We don't, only thing we knew when I was growing up was submissive, you know, about submission. That's it. It wasn't all this other stuff. Um, and so what I've done in my own life is make love intentional where I write to love. At the end of each podcast episodes, I write a letter to my future wife because I want to make sure that I can keep on keeping top of mind what I desire in a woman, what I desire in a wife, who I am going to be when I show up for her. And I do the work. I go through therapy so that I can uncover and heal those broken parts of me so that I can be whole for her. Okay. Thank you. Amen. Any other questions? Right over here. Yeah. Y'all just come and stand in the line. Uh, wait, wait, you sat down. All right. Any other questions? Huh? That's it. That's the only question. All right, come on. If you have a question, please just come to the uh, center of the aisle. My question is, for the women that have no desire to be married, but they still want to have relations with a man, do we still have a chance at heaven? <laughs> Master Warren, I think um, Pastor Walter. Wow. It's very hot. the one. The doors of the church are now old back. Let's it. Come on, honesty. Honestly, hey man. <laughs> Talk on it, Pastor. So, so the question, the question was, the question was for us or you women who you don't want to be married, right? But you still want to have relations. Where are the kids at the end here? Okay. 
I got to now I got to go another way. You get it? <laughs> um, the question was, it wasn't the question was not does God still love me? The question was, will I still make will I heaven? still make heaven? Uh, and let me just say this, because, you know, we, we're not a Baptist, a Kojic, a apostolic Pentecostal church. We are a Bible church, which means if it's in the Bible, we believe it. If it's in the Bible, we'll do it. If it's not in there, ain't no chance. We don't, we don't know what you're talking about. It's, if it's in the Bible, that's, that's who we are, right? Because that's what you want to do. Uh, living a life sold out for God and being a Christian and and, 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 and submitting to his will for your life means there's some things that you got to lay down. And we said earlier, sin is really you have a, legit, a, legit, a legitimate need. You, you, what you're expressing is a legitimate need. But when you fulfill it illegitimately and still say, but I still want heaven. Now that's when we have an issue. Uh, holiness is still right. You know, you can get mad with me. I don't mind because the Bible said it. I didn't. Okay. Uh, and, you know, the holiness is still right. God's way is still, you know, what he expects from us. And, um, you know, that's just that's just what it is. Uh, and we make no apologies for that. But at the same time, you, you got to at least try. Some of us ain't even trying. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, I talk to my fellows all the time. I said, man, I, I, this particular brother I've been talking to, he says, man, I'm, I'm, trying, to, I'm trying to get right, Pastor. I said, yeah, you say you're trying to get right, but I just saw you scrolling on Instagram and everything on Instagram was butt naked. My wife taught me this on Instagram. You can go to, if there's a, something that comes up in your Instagram feed that's unsavory, some, you know, you can go and put, click on the thing and put not interested. Ain't that what it is? <laughs> you can tell my wife we went through all this. And click uninterested. You're not interested in that girl in the bikini. You're not interested in the girl in the draw. Uh, but but there there has to be something in you that says, you know what? I at least I at least want to try. I want to do my best. Do my best. Do my best. So that's my encouragement to anybody who is not. You ain't looking for a husband, but you you still want to indulge. <laughs> You still want to satisfy your flesh and your licentiousness and your lasciviousness. <laughs> <laughs> I, I encourage you to, to, to not do that and to, to hold on to God with all you got. If you want to make heaven, that is. You want to make heaven. Listen. Did y'all enjoy this episode? Y'all give it up for this dynamic panel. Thank y'all so much. Edison's MC Light, Erica Campbell, Pastor Warren Campbell, Kevin Fredericks, Melissa Fredericks, Jarrell Gwynn. Listen, thank y'all so much. They were so dynamic. Listen, we'll be back uh, five o'clock today. Make sure you tell your friends and family members, show up. Uh, we're gonna have an amazing time. Thank y'all so much for support the podcast. All right. Ladarian thrusted suddenly into child protective services in 2015. My nephew, black, a boy. The likelihood of being adopted outside of kinship, slim to none. Armani, 16 years old, black, a boy, with five years in the foster care system before I even knew his name. The likelihood of ever being adopted, yep, you guessed it, slim to none. While Ladarian and Armani were trying to survive and barely thrive in an overpopulated and underfunded foster care system, I was living my own life, doing well professionally. Having been a single father with a daughter who at that point was doing well in college, it was my time to live my life, right? Wrong. I felt unsettled, tireless, agitated. There are just too many of our black children stuck in ambiguity and in the limbo of the foster care system. In 2017, I legally adopted my nephew, Ladarian. Fast forward to 2019, I had no ties to this other young king, but I felt God instructed me to adopt him also, and I obeyed. Starting over with parenting should have been enough, right? Working with various foster care and adoption agencies to help bring awareness to the countless young black kings in the foster care system should have decreased my agitation, right? 
joining the board of directors of Advantage Adoption, an organization that helps find permanent adoptive homes for children in foster care, should have led to some type of resolve, right? No, not at all. None of it felt like I had done enough. I now realize that every one of those experiences was laying the fundamental foundation for my life's mission, Kingdom Royale. Kingdom Royale will be a luxury, state-of-the-art home for foster boys. Our first location will be in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. We will utilize the whole person approach that instills identity, empowers them to advocate for themselves, and enlightens them regarding new perspectives and limitless options that they thought were impossible. Though the young kings will attend the local public schools that are in proximity to Kingdom Royale, our at-home curriculum will broaden their worldview through participating in the arts, attending various cultural events, learning about and engaging in multifaceted discussions about current events and even relevant historical contexts, introducing them to gardening and landscaping and even caring for our animals on our farm and on-site stables. We just launched our startup capital campaign with the goal of raising $2.8 million. Now, why $2.8 million? Well, in 2017, I created a web series in which I performed random acts of kindness for targeting the homeless community. One of the most notable successes was that one of the videos went viral, garnering 28 million views. However, one of my biggest regrets is that I didn't raise a single dollar to help in implementing a more sustainable plan for the homeless community. So throughout the years, with much remorse. I reflected on not maximizing that moment. I knew if at that time, just 10% of the viewers donated $1, we would have raised at least $2.8 million that could have really established long-term support for the homeless community, or at least started a long-term initiative to do so. This is my do-over. This is our new beginning. Together, we can attack this at the root by specifically helping our homeless black boys who are already disproportionately represented in the American foster care system. I'm LaTerris R. Whitfield. I've been nominated for three regional Emmys documenting my work with the homeless as well as my personal adoption journey. Despite those accolades, the greatest award for me is truly providing the infrastructure for a transformed life. Visit KingdomRoyale.com for more details. Crown a king and make a donation today. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.